So yeah, my name is Saram Davis. I am doing a DPhil on antibiotic persistence in bacteria. So some of you may have met me yesterday in my talk on vaccinology. And um, today I'm actually going to talk to you about something that's a little bit more close to home, which is antimicrobial resistance and the many ways uh, bacteria manage to evade our attempts at stopping them in their tracks. So Today I'm going to cover an, a, a brief introduction to bacteria. I'm going to talk to you about how antimicrobials work and then going to talk about a uh, little bit about uh, antimicrobial resistance and the many ways uh, bacteria get around antibiotics. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some new technologies that are emerging in this field. And then I'm going to cover some alternative survival mechanisms, uh, which we'll get to later on in the lecture. So a tiny little bit about me again, in case you missed yesterday. Um, I joined the Griffin Lab in 2019. Here are my two wonderful supervisors, Professor Ashley Griffin and Dr. Melanie Gould. This lab uh, is the Griffin Lab and it focuses directly on uh, social evolution in bacteria and how bacteria sort of may cooperate or not necessarily uh, to sort of uh, survive and um, get through sort of different situations. So our focus today, as I've mentioned, is on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, this is Dane Sally Davis. She was the chief medical officer between 2010 and 2019, and she identified that antimicrobial resistance is a ticking time bomb with lots of emerging issues with lots of uh, different bacteria being resistant to antimicrobials. Uh, this has really uh, severe uh, medical implications. Uh, it may be that one day we might not be able to as easily treat infections um, or bacterial infections uh, as anywhere near as easily as we have done in the past. And this is, is a very concerning issue. Uh, anti antimicrobial resistance has also been identified by the World Health Organization as one of the top 10 threats to global health. Um, so if some of you saw the vaccination talk yesterday, um, so this is in line with things like vaccine hesitancy. Um, so it's, it's a really large sort of emerging global threat, uh, something that we need to start sort of tackling imminently. So a little bit about bacteria. Uh, what are the main features of a bacterial cell? So you may have come across this in schools, sort of bacteria tend to be um, single cell organisms with no membrane bound organelles, um, you know, relatively simple, uh, just a nucleoid for their DNA. So we'd have a nucleus in our cells. Um, they have plasmids, which are small uh, uh, bits of DNA uh, that can be transferred from cell to cell so they can share that information. Uh, they have ribosomes um, and then for motility, they have um, a flagellum, uh, which is like a tail, enables them to sort of swim through media and pili as well for a little bit for motility. Uh, but now to talk a little bit more about uh, the cell wall structure. So this is very important for bacteria because I guess this is like uh, uh, the, the stuff that keeps the bad stuff, uh, well, the structure that keeps the bad stuff out and the good stuff in. And we have two main types of uh, cell wall structure depending on whether it's a gram positive or a gram negative bacterium. So again, you may have encountered, encountered this in school, uh, for example, the gram staining technique of whether the um, cells retain the dye or not. And this is all down to um, the organization of the peptidoglycan layers uh, uh, versus the membranes. So gram negative bacteria will have an outer membrane and an inner a plasma membrane um, sandwiching a little pepto peptidoglycan layer, whereas uh, gram positive bacteria will have a larger peptidoglycan layer with just a, an inner plasma membrane. Bacteria divide by binary fission, so this is like a, a form of clonal division, um, so they replicate themselves to create another identical cell. Uh, they, this is a sped up version of how quickly they divide. Thank goodness they don't divide this quickly. Uh, however, they, they do already sort of achieve division rates of up to sort of well down to 20 minutes per division um, in E. coli. So they're pretty fast at dividing, which makes them very good at colonizing and infecting. We have different types of bacteria as well, so different shapes. We've got spirochetes, 
Uh, we've got spherical uh, bacteria and then we've also got rod shaped bacteria. My key focus is actually on uh, gram negative rod shaped bacteria such as E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So that's a very brief introduction to um, bacteria. We're now going to start looking a little bit at antibiotics. So a very brief history of antibiotics. Now I've got a picture here, some mouldy bread, and there are some sort of indications that even in sort of ancient Egypt, if people had wounds, they would put a, a piece of mouldy bread on the wound, which would seem odd because you'd think that that would contaminate it. But little did they know that that would likely contain yeast. And of course, yeast produce um, penicillium or pen penicillin from like penicillium colonies. Uh, so there were sort of means of um, fighting bacterial infections all the way back then. But it wasn't actually until 1928 that this was, I guess, acknowledged officially within the scientific field uh, when Alexander Fleming uh, discovered um, how a penicillium colony uh, inhibited bacterial growth. And this is a little bit of a haphazard discovery um, because Alexander Fleming uh, left the plates on the bench and went away on holiday and he was sort of carrying out normal um, sort of bacterial experiments and then actually in this instance uh, penicillin would just be a contaminant on the plate and uh, he found that this contaminant actually led to very good bacterial inhibition which then led to the discovery of penicillin which was actually a very um, pivotal moment, especially in consideration of sort of world wars, because all of a sudden um, these bacterial infections could now be stopped in their tracks and no longer uh, potentially fatal. Um, so this is a very, very key moment. Now, how do antimicrobials work? Well, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, penicillin actually comes from uh, yeast, uh, penicillium. So Antibiotics or antimicrobials tend to be naturally derived substances from yeasts and um, or fungi and uh, soil dwelling bacteria. And it's quite awesome, really. A lot of these have been used to um, used in bacterial warfare against other microbes. So if you're thinking about um, creating more space for yourself and your clonally derived colony, uh, you can produce some kind of um, antibacterial substance or antimicrobial substance to inhibit anything growing too close to you. Uh, so they have quite an interesting origin, um, but antimicrobials have uh, various targeting pathways. So you can have antimicrobials that inhibit cell wall synthesis. Uh, for example, penicillin is um, an antibiotic that inhibits cell wall synthesis. Uh, you can have inhibition of protein synthesis. Uh, so this is um, another type of antibiotic that I tend to work with, uh, which is an aminoglycoside, uh, which targets protein synthesis and specifically ribosome dimerization. Um, you can also have alteration of cell membranes, inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis, which there's another antibiotic that I tend to use, which is um, a fluoroquinolone, uh, which stops DNA gyrase functioning correctly and um, so DNA structure is sort of uh, disrupted within the cell. And lastly, anti-metabolite activity. Um, so you can get things that dis disrupt the metabolism within the cell. So all things that lead to um, subsequent cell death or in some cases bacteriostasis, bacteriostasis where um, bacteria can't divide. They just sort of like frozen in time, so to speak, uh, which in a bacterial infection within the host would then allow the immune system sufficient time to target and, and attack the infection and overcome it. However, with all of these incredible different pathways of targeting bacteria and stopping them in their tracks, bacteria are incredibly plastic and able to um, develop resistance against all of these different mechanisms. This can be anything from um, just degrading the antibiotic or modifying it, uh, rendering it useless. Uh, you can have increased efflux activity. So this involves um, pumping out the antibiotics quicker than they can enter the cell. You can have reduced permeability so that 
fewer sort of or smaller concentrations of the antibiotic get in in the first place. And you can also have target modification. So, for example, you can modify the DNA target target or um, related uh, proteins uh, so that you don't get um, actual binding of the antibiotic to the target. And then you can also do that with uh, ribosomes and alter the shape. For example, there's different recognition sites. Um, so bacteria are very, very good at acquiring resistance against antibiotics. Um, but I feel like conceptualizing this may be a bit tricky, especially if some of you are sort of slightly newer to um, antibiotics and, and bacteria. So I like to play a really sort of fun castle analogy. Um, so obviously, uh, being from Wales myself, um, I find castles very uh, cool and fun to talk about. Um, obviously, you can go and see loads of castles if you're lucky enough to live in Wales. And I like to think of sort of very primitive bacterial cells as castles. So you might have a, a little wooden castle and this would be very easy to overcome by say an army, they could just knock it down very easily and destroy it. And I like to think of that as a very primitive bacterium and a very simple antibiotic. But then um, we find that castles that uh, were somehow built on hills may actually um, be better at surviving an army. For example, you could see the army coming or um, once the army's arrived, you've got the better vantage point. And this again is like a bacterium. So a bacterium that maybe uh, confers sort of like a thicker cell wall or um, just uh, less permeability to antibiotics is would be the only one that would survive the antibiotic attack. And then that stands as the blueprint from which to build more bacteria or more castles. And then this kind of just keeps going on and on. This is the analogy that keeps on giving because castles then evolve further by being more gated, being on hills. Um, you get sort of then stone castle structures then you get stone walls. And again, bacteria just keep on building resistance. Um, if you think about sort of like invaders, uh, you get sort of more and more elaborate means of um, surviving. And uh, that would then sort of create more and more blueprints from which to make successful and completely resistant fortifications, which is how I like to think of bacterial cells. Uh, it goes further again, you get sort of arrow slits so that you can render the attackers useless. So I like to think of this like uh, the antibiotic degrading enzymes. Uh, you can actually destroy the attacker and then you can also um, Sort of change how you can perceive the attacker so you might be able to uh, just divide really fast and sort of um, amplify yourself uh, if you have an attacker on the horizon so for example with bacteria you can you can change if you if you can actually like sense the antibiotic you can change your reaction in response uh, so we see all of these dynamics in bacteria which i just find fascinating to think how humans have built castles to resist things and and bacteria kind of build themselves um, in such a way that's selected for by antibiotics and it goes further. I do apologise. I got a little bit carried away with this castle analogy and um, you get to the point where your fortifications just get so strong and you have um, sort of a special gated entrances with lots of defence mechanisms uh, and then eventually you protect yourself with a drawbridge where you stop letting things in altogether or even a moat to reduce the things that can get in again. Um, so actually drawing this back to antibiotics and bacteria. Um, if we think of increased cell wall thickness, as we see in gram negative bacteria, that allows um, less antibiotics through. If we think of increased efflux activity, that's I guess like chucking people out back out of the castle if they do manage to invade. And then degrading or modifying enzymes would be like secreting something that's going to render the attacker useless. Uh, but what's really, really fascinating to me about this is that with all of these modifications and adaptions, bacteria don't necessarily acquire resistance in the presence of the antibiotic in the sense that they mutate directly uh, because of the antibiotic pressure. 
Um, it, not necessarily the case. In, in reality, it's actually there is a mutation that has occurred and this advantageous mutation is selected for. So you do require the antibiotic pressure to maintain this selection and uh, to keep uh, the, the bacteria sort of like maintaining that phenotype. For example, if um, there was an antibiotic selection pressure on um, this, this cell here and um, the adaptation was to produce um, an enzyme that could inhibit or uh, modify the, um, the antibiotic. Uh, this production of the enzyme would require energy. And so over time, if the antibiotic did not um, present, was not presented to the cell, uh, this ad ad advantageous uh, resistance mutation would become a bit redundant. And so you would um, stop necessarily like creating this or overexpressing this enzyme to fight against the antibiotic. So it's very similar again, like going back to our Carson analogy. Um, it's why we don't see that everyone builds uh, massive fortresses to um, protect themselves because there's no longer a selection pressure from an army, for example, that's about to invade. You know, the queen doesn't live in the, the most fortified castle in the UK. She lives in a palace that's very beautiful. It has a fence, but it's very limited protection. And that's, again, very similar to, to bacteria. They're not constantly just um, piling on all of these resistance mechanisms. Uh, it's actually a little bit more chilled because they're not always going to be exposed. It's only when we see uh, hospital situations where we get sort of superbug emergence and we've got things like MRSA, which is a methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And again, that's that's a bit of a superbug because it's more likely to be exposed to these range of drugs and it's more likely to sort of maintain these resistance mutations over a longer period of time. Uh, now let's look at a real life example. So this example is a large plate that's been um, a large Petri dish, I should say, that has a, um, a load of sort of E. coli growing at the edges on a media source, which is like a jelly uh, with nutrients in it. And as we go further towards the center, the antibiotic concentration is increasing. Uh, for example, uh, this may have uh, ciprofloxacin or trimethropin on it. And uh, as you go towards the center, uh, the antibiotic concentration is increasing. Now, initially, we don't see any growth until an advantageous mutation is selected for that enables that colony, colony to then go on and colonize a higher concentration of antibiotic. And these are independent um, evolution, <clears throat> evolution events um, whereby that colony can expand and grow. But then, of course, that gets inhibited at different points as well. And this experiment was carried out over a 100 day period. And um, so eventually we got to this, where it essentially went through loads of independent sort of mutation events to um, acquire new forms of resistance to fight higher and higher doses of antibiotics. And I'm really sorry, my PowerPoint presentation has just freaked out and um, I will resume my slide now. Um, but actually, let's take this as a perfect opportunity to have a 30 second breather and I will get back to you in just a second. Right, um, Microsoft meltdown averted. Uh, so yeah, back to this slide on um, antibiotic resistance in real time. Uh, yeah, so eventually we get a strain that has acquired very, very high resistance against the antibiotic. Um, and that can happen over, you know, arguably quite a short period of time, over 100 days. If there is a significant selection pressure and enough nutrients, we can select for a mutation that is very advantageous and can confers very, very high resistance. So with antibiotics, if some of them are failing and, and bacteria can get around them, why don't we just make loads more antibiotics? Well, that's the problem. It's just not as simple as that. Uh, a lot of antibiotic resistance research and sort of antibiotic um, sort of 
discovery takes a very, very long time. So you've got years and years of preclinical and clinical research, uh, which requires a high in investment to start with. Uh, and so you're spending lots and lots of money and then you find something that's maybe a little bit more um, successful at inhibiting antibiotic growth or even being bactericidal and killing the antibiotic uh, and killing the bacteria. Um, but as you can see, you get down to spending, you know, millions upon millions of dollars on this sort of investment to, to find a drug that's going to be successful. And it's only when you start sort of selling this to um, uh, various clinics and uh, medical organisations that you start to even break even. And you can see that that can happen over a 20, sort of 25 year period. Uh, so that's a, a very, very long time. And then considering uh, bacteria can potentially acquire resistance under arguably extreme selection pressure, but still over even the course of 100 days, that could be the equivalent of 25 years of clinical research and um, deployment and it's rendered ineffective. We also see, um, and I, I, again, I covered this yesterday with vaccinations, um, you have sort of difficulty licensing various uh, antibiotics owing to the fact that they may be toxic or slightly toxic to the host. Um, so we've got to go through rigorous phase trialing um, and eventually we might get through, so from say maybe 20 odd candidates to begin with, we might get through to fewer than five actually being approved in the end. Um, so it's a long old process. And so simply just generating a new antibiotic to target um, bacteria is not as simple as that. However, there are sort of new methods emerging, and this is kind of based on um, the idea of using sort of viruses that specifically target bacteria. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So these are bacteriophages and uh, they can directly target and they're very specific to um, various strains and species of bacteria and archaea. Uh, again, this is kind of like unleashing a specific virus that targets bacteria and these can be um, very safe for the human host to use because they have completely mean, different means of recognising cells. Um, so that means that obviously we have eukaryotic cells, bacteria have prokaryotic cells and they can target and they can specifically target prokaryotes so that they are very sort of benign and safe for us to be exposed to. And it's also worth noting here that this isn't necessarily the newest technology. Again, this is derived from nature. So bacteriophages exist within the environment. And um, I believe the Soviet Union actually pioneered this technology around a similar time to when we um, went crazy with antimicrobials. And actually in places like Georgia, um, in Europe, well, Eastern Europe, I should say, or East of Europe, um, you can buy um, sort of phage treatment for a bacterial infection over the counter. So you could argue that it's a, it's a new method for us and it could be quite groundbreaking for opening new doors with targeting bacteria, but it's a very um, old method in other ways and been around for over a hundred years. So how do bacteriophages actually work? So if this is our bacteriophage, it can bind to the bacterial cell. It will then insert its little um, genetic sequence. This could be RNA or DNA. Uh, this is then uh, replicated by the cell and translated into the proteins that constitute this um, bacteriophage. It's then reassembled. And if this is repeated over a large number of times, these reassembled bacteriophages burst out of the cell and cause cell lysis and spread to neighbouring cells. And this is a pre pretty neat mechanism. Again, as I mentioned, it's so specific to the cell um, and it can completely stop a, an antibiotic resistant infection in its tracks. And here's like a real life um, story about this. So, yeah, this is an incredible story about a man called Tom Patterson. Uh, he went on holiday with his wife and uh, fell very, very um, ill um, uh, after eating some food, I think, on and they were on a cruise in Egypt and he ate something and got dreadful food poisoning. 
um, it was an, an Acinetobacter infection uh, that became life threatening. And this um, Acinetobacter infection became fully antibiotic resistant and was essentially just um, ravaging his body. He was um, yeah, very, very sick in hospital and it got to the point where uh, doctors were sort of talking about mm, maybe he's not going to make it because I, I believe he had sepsis on multiple occasions. Um, but it was actually down to his incredible wife, um, Stephanie Strathdy, who just couldn't face the idea of losing her husband, um, especially considering she'd actually worked on Acinetobacter in, in her lab in years prior, and it had just been quite a, a benign and, and sort of non-pathogenic bacterium to work with. She just couldn't believe that this could take over and um, essentially kill her husband. So she started doing lots of online research and then found the potential to use phage therapy as a last resort against uh, this bacterium. Now phages are very very specific so similar to how um, you may have viruses that are specific to different species of animals uh, for example Covid may infect a human but it may not infect a mouse potentially i'm not sure but they'll have different recognitions for different species and um, so viruses tend to be quite specific uh, she went about sequencing the bacterium that was infecting her husband and managed to find a lab that uh, were incredible and created a cocktail of phages uh, that they they used to treat the infection and uh, miraculously um, Tom Patterson made a full recovery and um, and survived this essentially a sort of life threatening infection. Um, and it's an incredible story. And there are multiple podcasts on this that I recommend listening to. And there's also a book that was written about it. Um, it was just, yeah, it's very, very interesting. And so it offers quite an exciting opportunity for the future in uh, bacterial treatment and that there may be novel methods of uh, treating bacteria. Oh, but with all forms of uh, our lines of attack, bacteria uh, can also fight back against phages. Again, partially because they've um, existed alongside each other over the course of evolutionary history. So of course, bacteria will have certain defense mechanisms against these phages. Again, going back to a castle analogy, if you're going to get attacked, you're going to figure out a way of surviving, even sort of like building a thicker wall or even stopping um, the invading army from coming anywhere near you. So again, going back to that sort of thing, we can have um, the inhibition of sort of even binding. So the phage can't land. Uh, the phage can't insert its nucleotide sequence. Um, you might um, inhibit the replication or even use certain enzymes to destroy the, the DNA sequence recognised as non-self within the bacterial cell. Um, and then you also can inhibit the bacteriophage from even being able to reassemble um, or assemble after creating loads of new copies. So bacteria are pretty wily against things like that. But that being said, phages are incredible and there are so many different types of phages that if you treat it treat with a cocktail of, of lots of different types it would be very diff difficult for the bacterial cell to be resistant against all of them simultaneously um, so that is quite a an exciting emerging technology that we're sort of beginning to utilize more and more in the west but it's not all just about resistance. Um, this has definitely dominated the field of um, bacterial and antimicrobial research because we see it so commonly. But do bacteria always have to develop resistance to survive antibiotics? So for, this is a, a fun example. You've got a bacterium that's or a species of bacteria that's never previously been treated with ant antibiotics. So it might just be a soil borne strain that you've acquired by just going digging uh, somewhere. And then you grow that in a test tube. And then after it's grown to a sufficient density, you treat with a really high dose of antibiotic solution and you leave it for 24 hours. You then uh, wash away the antibiotic solution and plate that out onto Petri dishes to assay for survivors. So there are two lines of thought here. 
Will there be any survivors? No, the unusually high dose will kill all bacteria, especially if they've never been exposed before. It's a novel dose, they're going to get attacked and they're not really going to have much time to acquire resistance. It's not like an increasing concentration scale as we saw with the, uh, the giant E. coli plate. This is a, a forceful attack um, deployed without any warning. You know, can they even survive that? Of course not. Or yes, they could survive, they could be survivors, but how, how can they do it? Well, the reality is that they actually can survive and these survivors are called persister cells. So this is truly what I work on um, and persister cells are um, tend to be sort of dormant cells that don't divide, um, have a reduced or halted metabolism that enables them to become antibiotic tolerant. And these were first discovered by Joseph Bigger in 19, 1944. And this was all around the time of the emergence of sort of penicillin treatment. And there's lots of excitement at the potential to use antibiotics uh, for sterilization in the lab. And so Joseph Bigger experimented with um, Staph aureus and penicillin and uh, found that even after treatment with um, high doses of penicillin, there would still be some remnants of um, sort of cells left. And so it was uh, Joseph Bigger that coined the term persister because they're able to persist through the antibiotic treatment. So how do they actually react to antimicrobials? So if this cell in light blue is our persister cell and the dark blue cells are, are our sort of non-persisters, our general cells within the population, um, these cells are dividing. And I want to add in here that there is no genetic difference between these cells. It's just a phenotypic dis a difference. So if you took um, the genetic sequence within this cell and the genetic sequence within this cell, it would be identical. It's just the phenotype that they're expressing from that sequence. Uh, so for example, this one is a fast growing phenotype or fast dividing, and this one is a non-dividing phenotype. And as you can see, the numbers of the cells in dark blue are increasing, but the light blue cell is staying the same. You then treat with your antibiotic solution, and before you know it, the susceptible um, dark blue cells die and that leaves our um, persister cell. Now the persister cell is dormant and it cannot divide in the presence of the antibiotics. It instead um, is just sort of waiting around and you can treat for up to sort of 24 hours, even more, and uh, this cell will just be in the presence of very high dose of antibiotics without dying. And then you remove the antibiotic treatment and then this cell can sense and switch back to a normal and readily dividing cell again to generate a whole new population of bacteria until at some point down the line, another one of those cells phenotypically switches into a persister. What percentage of a bacterial population are in the persister state? So luckily for us, it's a very, very low uh, proportion. It tends to be around um, up to 1%, so from 0.001 to 1%. Uh, so they're quite rare within a bacterial population. And anyone with a healthy immune system would be able to fight off a um, persister cell, um, well, fight off the persister cells left after antibiotic doses, owing to just having a healthy immune system and uh, that sort of functional immune system would just be able to sweep through and clean up any of these um, cells that are left behind. It's only an issue uh, in immunocompromised in individuals where uh, they don't necessarily have a functioning immune system. And um, as a result, these cells can generate new colonies time and time again after really high antibiotic treatments. Uh, so they can be quite a severe issue clinically. And a key example there would be in cystic fibrosis patients who unfortunately um, suffer from buildup in um, dehydrated mucus and as a result have an immunocompromised state where bacterial cells can colonize and persist for years um, and form chronic infections. So actually understanding more about these persister cells is very important for targeting these infections clinically.
So here's an example of uh, my work carried out in the lab. I would grow um, bacteria in a culture to a sufficient turbidity or you know, cell density. Um, and the way that we actually um, sort of measure cell growth in the lab is um, through growing it in, in a liquid culture and then diluting that serially. So you create a serial dilution where you uh, say, for example, you have your large culture and then you take a sample and dilute that into a set volume of um, liquid like a um, salt solution. And then you'll take another sample of that diluted solution and transfer it into another salt solution and then keep going until you've got a sufficient dilution. Um, so uh, quite a dense culture here, actually. And um, you could arguably carry out another serial dilution, but these colonies are just about countable. Um, this would be a 10 to the 6 dilution. So that's um, or maybe 10 to the 5. Um, so that's almost like a 10,000 fold dilution. No. 100,000 fold dilution for 10 to the 5 and a million fold dilution for 10 to the 6. So there are a lot of cells in the original culture. So you grow a colony like that or um, a culture like that and measure the number of colonies. So this would be roughly around um, this amount of growth here. So it's quite dense. And then uh, you make sure you have tons of replicates as well. That's really important in microbiology because you might see an artifact in one uh, treatment and that may not be replicated in other treatments. So these are just a, a small sample of the reps that I usually do. And bearing in mind, this is our sort of cell count before. After treatment for 24 hours in antibiotic solution, we get these survivors on the plate here um, with sort of different dilutions depending on um, different points in the growth curve. So again, we've, we're about 10 to the 5 here. And this is actually a zero fold dilution, but because it's such a large plate, the antibiotic becomes um, very dilute as it's spread out. And uh, as you can see, there are survivors here. Uh, there may be, yeah, OK, this is quite a low number. And that is a great thing for us uh, if we're not immunocompromised, um, which unfortunately, if you do have underlying conditions, it means that even these sort of small number of um, cells that are left behind after a really high dose of antibiotic treatment can still survive. Um, so this is a real issue clinically and um, yeah, it's my key uh, research focus to try and understand what on earth is going on with these cells, uh, how on earth they form and um, if we can stop them um, because that would really help in the fight against antibiotic um, persistence and potentially subsequently resistance. So this may ultimately then link in with antibiotic resistance research um, in that um, these are a subset of cells that are going to survive regardless of containing specific resistance genes or not. And there are certain questions leading to, um, you know, does having this underlying level of um, or this underlying ability to survive come what may buy the bacteria time to then acquire or develop resistance um, against um, antibiotics in the future. So, for example, if you have a large colony, you get initially knocked with antibiotics, um, but you manage to survive. Does that buy you more time to acquire a successful mutation that's going to enable you to survive the next round of antibiotic treatment? And um, some research does indicate this may be the case, but then other pieces of research may be not so much. Uh, so again, another emerging part of uh, research in this field. So that is um, my overview of the research. So here is the overview of the whole lecture where we talked a little bit about bacteria, how antimicrobials work, um, touching on antimicrobial resistance, then going in to look at new technologies and other survival strategies such as persistence. Thank you very much for joining my talk today. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you about my research. Uh, this is my email address in case you have any questions about um, anything I've talked about today. And then here is a list of incredibly useful resources that I used to pull these slides together.